today, um, Johnny and I are going to talk about the subject of prophecy and the prophetic. Um, this is such an interesting topic, even in our home, because <laughs> for years, um, Johnny has been, you know, perceiving the voice of the Lord regarding big picture things. And, um, you know, I, I remember even during the last election, watching the results of the election <laughs> come in and wondering, you know, everybody's worried about who the president's going to be. And all I could think about is, am I married to a false prophet or not? You know? <laughs> and, um, so we've had a lot of conversations over the years about, um, of course, the prophetic gift, and it's our passion to see all believers walk in their prophetic gifting. Um, and so we've done a lot of training in that area. We also have tried to grow personally in that and um, the level of influence and, and places of um, that our voice is heard. We've tried both of us in our own ways to really be stewards over yeah. those relationships and those situations and seek the Lord for what he might want to speak through us. Yeah. Um, but then we have these deeper conversations like, what is a prophet? Are you a prophet? Am I married to a prophet? Am I a prophet? Because I prophesy. And we're not going to pretend to you know, unpack the entire subject mm -hmm. here, but we could start with what do you believe about the prophetic in general? And specifically, um, what about the prophetic in this season in our generation and in the body of Christ? Yeah. Well, you know, so I guess I'll share what my, uh, call it my personal philosophy on the prophetic is. There are, there are different ones out there. Um, you know, first of all, uh, as you know, I've, I, I've never introduced myself as prophet. I've never called myself that. Uh, Let I, me say, I'm so glad that you yeah. don't, <laughs> but I am glad you have a prophetic gift and calling and yeah. office, et cetera. And I, I've been, I've been called prophet in multiple settings, multiple nations, sure. whatever. And, but there's a reason I have a, a hesitancy to call myself that. And I don't knock anybody who does or doesn't do it. But um, there's an understanding even for myself that um, the Lord has used it, uh, the prophetic gift dramatically and, and making declarations even over nations that have taken place uh, virtually immediately and discovering treasures and speaking with a mayor of a city or leader of a city and saying, hey, there's going to be uh, gold mines here and silver mines and salt mines and lost city of the Incas. And there's been, I, I have, you know, on record multiple of these situations that have uh, really borne out as I, to my, it, the way it works for me is when it happens, I go, wow, that was amazing. And, um, but I'm not amazed until it happens up to that point. I'm just sharing something that I'm seeing right. and I don't have the certainty of it. That's you know part of understanding the way I'm wired. I guess my philosophy or the way I'm wired with it. I'm sometimes just as, as greatly surprised as someone else when it actually uh, happens. And it's, uh, it blesses me cause I'm like, Oh good. I actually saw something that was right. And, and, yeah, so, and also you, you are definitely a prophetic voice and in, in certain streams of the body of Christ. Um, I know that through your Facebook, um, and blogs, we release a lot of prophetic insight that you have regarding different issues or different regions, et cetera. Um, and the Elijah list, a uh, prophetic, um, what would you call that? They're more than just social media. Elijah list is a prophetic platform, prophetic for platform. Yeah, yeah. They've picked up a lot of your prophetic words. And so they've gotten a lot of traction and it's always humbling for, for us. And I would say for you, when you read the impact that they're having and it causes you to, um, I mean, you've always taken it seriously, but the more people really listen and, and, and are influenced by the things that you share that you feel like are from God, you, you don't take that lightly. So I love it that you're going to share some of your, your philosophy on this. Yeah. And it, you know, I have a track record of, uh, you know, I say around 25 years that I know of, um, where I will speak something and then 
it'll it'll bear out to be truth on you know there's there's prophetic encouragement honestly a whole lot of what comes out on the elijah list i say perhaps upwards of 90 percent of it is more prophetic it's called a, a prophetic word but it's really encouragement it's perhaps even so vague that we don't even know if it was fulfilled or not. Sometimes I share along that, that line too, right. you know, when you yep. have breakthrough and you're like, you're going to have breakthrough and it's worded in some kind of way. Well, it's like, what does breakthrough look like? Was that a breakthrough in their character advance or was it a breakthrough in their finances? Was yeah, it there's not like a concrete way to right. say it was, it was a correct or incorrect prophetic word. It's, it has to be, it's only when you like speak to a somebody who's a candidate say you're going to be the next president and or this is going to happen that way or there's going to be this specific treasure discovered or you know i'm going back around 25 years i remember when i when i became aware i literally thought to myself i need to be careful things i say because we were in a in a in a church uh and i remember it was trujillo peru and i got this scripture um, out of Isaiah, I'll make streams in the desert, and, and the place was in the desert. In fact, literally where the church was, was an area called Rio Seco, which is the dry river. And so uh, there's no river there, and they hadn't had rain in hundreds of years. And I just shared, I said, I read that scripture, and I said, the Lord, I said, I saw a vision of this place literally being swept into the river of God. And so there was jubilation and celebration, and this is wonderful. And then three months later, the pastor caused me and and it was an el nino phenomenon that year and so they had a a flash flood Mm -hmm. and this the the church was literally swept away in the river and so he said why didn't you tell me that it was literally what you literal what you're talking i go it was literal i said i had no idea it was literal. I just saw this picture and I stated it. So anyway, those, uh, you know, so I have uh, hundreds and hundreds of cases, testimonies, examples. Some of them we've put in books and other things where we've seen the Lord do this. But I still have a great hesitancy in calling myself a prophet because I- I'll look and I may even be being generous, but I- I'll be aware that God has done much with it. But I, I was like, I'm saying, you know, I think I've told, I, I say, you know, about 80% of what I say, I've watched it fulfilled. And, and maybe 20%, either it wasn't the way I thought, or it didn't happen at all, or we're still waiting. And at times you're like, was it that, was that false? Was it the timings off? The, what, what is it? In some cases, it, it just clearly has to be, I misread it in some way. And so... Based on that, you know, I, I have, uh, it, by missing it, it gets enough to make you remain humble and in some capacity and make you not want to just take the tag of profit on, uh, especially when there's misunderstanding in the body of Christ of what you do with somebody who calls himself a prophet. Mm. And because there, there's a high standard the body of Christ wants to put and they apply an Old Testament standard to a prophet and say, well, if it doesn't happen, then you should be killed and stoned and what what not and so there's no no sense volunteering for that <laughs> um but you know i think there's so much we're learning as the body of christ of how to be a prophetic uh, people and and the right culture for it you know it's something again interesting from uh prophet bob, bob jones who who taught so many of us many things and he was also a prophet who saw in part he missed it on a lot of uh big uh, things he prophesied, but he was right on a whole bunch of things. And of course, the people, you know, you want to do a search on false prophets, he'll get listed there for, for that. And there's the people who, uh, you know, they, they find anybody who gave a clear prophetic word. It's probably one of the reasons nobody wants to give a clear prophetic word. And somebody who gave a clear prophetic word and it didn't happen. And so they're false prophet from then on. And, and you have cer- certain prophets that have them all logged on the internet, all their, their false uh, prophecies. But Bob Jones said something years ago, he may have said it more than once, but that even the highest level prophet at the time, he says, was probably getting about, I think he said 66 and two thirds uh, correct, that they were being right, their accuracy level. And he said, really, that's as high as the body of Christ can take right now. Because if it increased, the level of accountability would be so high 
that we would see people dropping dead, as in when Ananias and Sapphira were around. When there's a higher move of God, there's a higher level of accountability. Hmm. And it's just, it wasn't my, what, something I said, but I, I like, hmm, I have to take that into consideration. That higher level of accuracy brings everyone into a higher level of accountability. And, um, you know, for the part of the body of Christ that want to put prophets under the high standard of, well, if you ever miss it, then you should be, you know, either spiritually killed or naturally killed. When you embrace that level of uh, extreme accountability, then the flip side of that is as the receivers, you're also under that. By that, I mean those who receive the prophetic word. It means if you do not go with a word, mm -hmm. then you're subject to dying or not dying. Death can be released over you because you didn't take it as seriously as, as that, as you could have. And so I don't think either one of us want to live under that level uh, of uh, perfectionism. And, and if you go to the New Testament, it's clear Paul, Paul the apostle, who was taken in the, into the third heaven, had revelations, and most of what he got was out of revelation um, from third heaven encounters and experiences. And he's the one in 1 Corinthians 13 said, well, we see in part, we prophesy in part. Then in chapter 14 of uh, 1 Corinthians, he says, now, you know, let two or three prophesy, let the rest judge. So there is clearly a different standard for the prophetic in the New Testament as opposed to the Old Testament. Old Testament, there was not Jesus in your heart. There was not the Holy Spirit. All the stuff that was made available through what Jesus did on the cross him ascending into heaven, sending the Holy Spirit to be the spirit of truth that can teach us. All those, uh, those factors were not there. So there did have to be a level of accountability that was increased. But he said, no, in essence, we're going to miss it at times, but it's okay um, because the Holy Spirit's in you and he will give you an eh if it's not him. And, and yet it will help you. It'll confirm things if you'll if you'll cherish it. And so I think there's a, a proper cherishing of the prophetic that the Lord wants to um, uh, teach us. And, um, and that's what we're, uh, we're learning to, to step into. You know, I think it's perhaps um, uh, Prophet Kim Clement, he got himself into the most, he's passed on uh, recently, but he got himself into the most trouble for calling himself a prophet and then for going on the record on things. This is going to happen by this date, this, this person, and then some of them didn't happen. And so that directly puts you in the, in the line of fire. But I, I, uh, I appreciate him and appreciate what he wanted to do. And in that, I think just the final part I want to uh, share on it, and then whatever interaction you have, Elizabeth, or questions, just make this more uh, simple and, and short, perhaps, is, um, uh, you know, go into why do we miss it as prophetic voices and whether you're just trying to hear God on your own it's like why do we why do we miss it why do prophets miss it why do prophetic people uh, miss it and and um, and so I'm gonna I think I have four I think pretty good reasons why we miss it so these are just I think just helpful for our own information and um, then again it's just part of my my philosophy on the prophetic number one reason we miss it and we're wrong is because we see in part and we prophesy in part, just what we we're talking right. about from 1 Corinthians uh, 13. And we have a mix. We have our preconceived ideas and notions, and, and we have a mix between what the Holy Spirit's pouring in and, and what our, our own thoughts are there. You know, to the, I tell people, to the degree you already had preconceived notions on a matter, to that degree, you better be more suspect about what you just received. I, I uh, tie it into, you know, like, coffee grounds when you have a coffee maker there's the coffee grounds you have in the top there and there's your ground coffee and then there's water being poured in right and but what comes out even though water's poured in because of your own coffee grounds what comes out is coffee and so um i think often the holy spirit is pouring something into us and we ask him and he pours but we have so many of our own grounds that what comes out is not necessarily, it's inspired by what he poured, mm -hmm. but it comes out in a mixture of mm -hmm. something. And to the degree we have less of our own coffee grounds, to that degree it's more like the original purity. And to the degree we have more of our own stuff, it comes out distorted. Mm -hmm. And so we can we can distort it in all kinds of um, ways. And and we can have be, 
we can be so confident from our last man, last time I went on the record and said, thus saith the Lord, and this happened, and it was right on, and, and, and yet the next time we're, we're doing that same thing, but we just blow it because on that time we went with all kinds of assumptions right. uh, of our own. So number one, because we see in part, number two, um, if it's a bad prophetic word and it's, or, it's, or a prophetic word of judgment, we know biblically even that if there is a repentance, then that changes it. It's like Jonah came into mm-hmm. uh, the Ninevans, uh, those from Nineveh, and said within 40 days, it's all done. He didn't even say, if you repent. He's just like, you're done for. You're cooked, toast, hang up. Uh, you know, it's done for. And yet they repented from the top to the bottom. Apparently his uh, his uh, incredible anointing on him is like there was a believability factor when um, perhaps it's the seaweed hanging out of his mouth and the smell of <laughs> uh, whale stomach juice on him that um, also <laughs> caused him to respond. But somehow they said from the leader to, you know, they all repented. And so there was no judgment on, on them. Which then made him look like a false prophet. Right. And which was his concern afterwards. He's like, you always have mercy. And I go and I'd say these things and, and they don't happen. You make me look bad. And so God's not trying to make a prophet. Uh, look good, particularly when it's bringing in a correction or a judgment. So number two reason is people make uh, the adjustment necessary for that not to happen. Number three, um, if there's a good prophetic word, it's similar to number two. Um, I think if people don't repent to the prophetic word, it can sabotage the prophetic word. And, and, and uh, example of that is the children of Israel, the Lord calls Moses and he says, Moses, I'm coming, I've descended, I'm taking you and this people, I'm taking you into the promised land. Yet that whole generation, including Moses, did not. And the Lord later on says, they did not enter because of their evil heart of unbelief. Mm -hmm. So God is not a false prophet, but he, he made a prophecy that did not happen. And there's a whole nother thing is that no prophecy ever dies. And so what didn't work for them, it went on to the next uh, generation, particularly a word from God. It goes somewhere mm-hmm. um, when it's in agreement with heaven. But it's a reality that, you know, if God can be a false prophet, then we might have to, well, we're not really going to stone him for that. And it's that it was part of a prophetic word is an invitation to believe something mm-hmm. and to cooperate with it, to repent to it, mm-hmm. uh, not repent the other kind of repentance. And so I think that's something we have to be uh, aware of as the body of Christ. I think really many things that Kim Clement spoke that too many in the body of Christ went into, well, we'll see. They went into we'll see mode. And if you have a majority of people go into we'll see mode, it's like, again, with Caleb, he says, we can go now and take the promised land. And they're like, no, we can't. And so they voided something and they delayed 40 years in entering into the promised land. The next generation essentially had to do because of that. And I I really think there are many things of God's grace um, over America. Even Kim Clement's last name, Clement, is mercy and grace, Mm -hmm. that there were things that could have been released, but we left them hanging to dry, so to speak. Oh, well, let's just see if he really is a prophet. He said these things. And we didn't understand how you can cooperate with the heart of God in a matter of prophetic word. And I think that's still um, what's out there a lot. We need to be aware of it. It's a, it's a, a part of the equation of, of pr- uh, prophetic um, accuracy. Yeah. And then finally, the fourth thing, um, a prophetic word can, uh, cannot happen because the timing is missed. And, mm-hmm. and I believe that the hardest thing in the prophetic is timing. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, uh, to me, that's even for myself. Um, I, you know, I gave a word at the beginning of the, of the year um, about the stock market. Well, first of all, about October of last year, before the election, I said, I see by March, the stock market going to 21,000. And that was, we were three and a half thousand away from that. That seemed like I don't think so. And again, the projections were, well, if Trump becomes president, we're going to lose that all these experts say how much the market was going to lose. And I say, he's going to be president because the Lord says he is, and the market's going to be 2,100 in in March, 21,000. And it happened. It hit 21,000 in March. So then I said, well, this is just the beginning. I said, I saw October and it say 27,000. And I had to put a disclaimer. I was like, I think that's this year, but it could be next year. And unfortunately, 
that's that's just the way I, I did. I, in the same way I saw the other, I saw October and I saw a 27,000. It looks right now where we're at early September and with all these storms, there's a lot of it. It looks, it looks difficult because we're not even 22 right now. Um, it looks miraculously impossible to hit 27th. And it may not, I don't know. All I do is report on what I see. And, um, but there's a, I, even I had to say, somebody could say, well, why don't you need to be more definitive? Is it this year or is it next year? That's a big deal. It's like, well, that's as good as I see right now. So that's my personal philosophy is like, I have to be okay with the level of, uh, uh, of unclarity, if we call it that, of which I see things. I see, I just know that there's a history of 25 years that it's profitable for me to, to go for things and say things that I, particularly that I know are, are from the heart of God. And I've seen them uh, turn into, uh, you know, really amazing thing. I think it's a little bit like baseball. It's like you swing at things and, and we don't want to be, you know, baseball players, a great baseball player is batting 300 and something, which means almost 70% of the time he is failing. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, but it's like, he wants another opportunity to swing at it. And, um, and so I don't think the Lord wants us to be, uh, um, he wants to be discouraged from swinging at things, but also, you know, proper humility in there. Be careful how, um, how you're framing perhaps what you say and, and a, a thus saith the Lord and all those things. We're supposed to speak with enough confidence, let him who speaks speak as an oracle of God. So you don't want to say, well, this perhaps could be, maybe, you, you know, you say something that just like, it doesn't require any faith to connect to. It's like, it's unlikely. So you have to say something according to the level of which you see it. But I think it's just part of this, um, this whole uh, learning curve we're going through uh, in, in the prophetic. So anyway, I just thought I'd share my perceptions of myself plus my <laughs> philosophy um, as, and you have an amazing uh, prophetic gift as well. And particularly for, as it relates to individuals and people and people's hearts. Uh, and it's not that you can't see the macro, you know, often what I can see better is the macro and the micro, maybe not as well, but um, they're both super valuable and they, they, they have, have, have their place, but we have to give, I think the Lord wants us to be in a place as a body of Christ to give each other room to grow and not put such severe standards on each other that we can't, uh, um, I, you know, take advantage of an amazing gift. That's awesome. Well, I think that's great for people to hear, especially people that follow your, your prophecies and it helps them kind of know where you're coming from personally, as you are giving those prophetic words, um, along those lines, I think they would be interested to know kind of how you, hear and perceive, because you said over and over again, I say what I see, um, and yet I don't, I think it's super, super rare, if at all, you've had like an open vision or something that's just the writing on the wall, so to speak, and you're just literally repeating what you're hearing or seeing. Um, it's more for you, an impression, and would you say that that's... Yeah, there's... You know, they come in different. I'll see a picture of, of something on the screen of your imagination, yeah, kind of the yeah. screen. And, you know, sometimes you see it. All I know how to say is with more veils and sometimes with less veils. Sometimes it's. And when you say see, you mean on the screen of your imagination. Like if I said the word apple right now, everybody can see an apple in their yeah. mind's eye. Right, right. That's if where you get your prophetic yeah. insights. And if we were to say a banana, the thing where you saw it shift there, that's that. And if I say yellow banana, you see something with a color, green banana, that screen is a screen the Lord will use for the prophetic. And then sometimes it's clearer than, than that. Like it, it's almost, it's almost open vision, but there's a point where you actually gain confidence in your spirit. You see something and something in like your knower goes off and you go, Oh, that is God. I'll often know the first time I say a prophetic word, I'll like, wow, I'll know more, more by how my declaration sounds to my spirit. And that gives me, I'll back it up and say more about it or even restate it again um, afterwards. But it can be, uh, yeah, you don't have to have seen an angel come down and open the scrolls. And some do uh, um, see that way. There's all kinds of ways of, of seeing. You can see through one veil no veil or 10 veils, but it's, it's still, uh, valid. 
way of seeing. Well, I'll just close. I know we're running out of time. Um, just kind of my perception on where, where we are in the body of Christ with the prophetic, um, really with all the gifts of the Spirit. I, I probably sound like a broken record on this one, but I always come back to the bigger picture of what is the point of all of this. And mm -hmm. the point of it is there is a God who wants intimacy with his sons and daughters, and he wants to be known um, because you can't have intimacy apart from mutual knowing of each other. And of course, he knows everything about every single one of us. He's very involved in every detail. Nothing slips past him concerning every one of our hearts and lives. And he wants us to know him like he knows us. And of course, it's going to take an eternity to know him. So there's this process of an invitation to a relationship with him through Jesus. But then there's the walking out of it. And in the Old Testament, you saw that walking out of his desire for intimacy with, with humanity by, um, by having prophets that were, their, their job was literally to hear and then speak exactly what was the heart of God right. for a situation or a people or a person, et cetera. Right. And, um, and that desire of his hasn't changed as it relates to the prophetic gifts and the office of prophet. It hasn't changed related to um, where we are in the body of Christ and our, our ability to, clarif to clearly prophesy, whether we're talking individuals using their prophetic gift or people who we look to um, in the body of Christ is more of a true prophetic voice, maybe the office of a prophet. Um, and, and that same goal of his is still there. It is that, that he would be known. And so I've noticed that our, and he's so thrifty. He does both at the same time. Like he doesn't just use you as a man, as his son, he's using you as a prophetic voice. God doesn't quote, use us. We're, none of us are expendable. He can accomplish the things he wants to accomplish without us, but he loves doing it with us because again, it's, it's an excuse for relationship with that person. So he didn't say, I want Johnny and Lo to be a prophet in my generation. He had and has an ongoing relationship with you. And so out of that relationship with you, he says, hey, let's do some things together. Mm -hmm. I'd, like, I'd like for you to learn how to prophesy and how to so know my heart. But in that, he says, what are you interested in? Mm -hmm. And he knew how he wired you from a little boy, the things that would, that would just kind of eat at you and make you very curious or very angry or very passionate. And I've noticed that that's where your prophetic giftings really kick in the strongest. Mm -hmm. um, the things that, that you feel passionate about, about God. Mm -hmm. and, and it, you know, one of the biggest prophetic stories that you have that we're not going to tell now, but it is of you in Peru and prophesying where things would be found that would literally change the economy of that entire nation. Mm -hmm. And, and that was like something super much on, on super much, greatly on your heart. Mm -hmm. You grew up as a little boy in that third world country and you were immersed in that poverty. Your mm -hmm. family experienced mm -hmm. that poverty mm -hmm. and you, you had, um, you had a mandate on you and your siblings as well from what your parents even picked up in the yeah. spirit. And so you, all of those things converge together. Your love for that country, yeah. your, your love to see the God of provision show up on someone's behalf in the midst of their poverty, your, um, your desire to know as a man, could God, would God oh, speak yeah. through yeah. me? And would he show his kindness to someone else who hasn't even acknowledged that they need him yet? Yeah. And so all of that converged into God making himself known to you and therefore through you. Yeah. And I think that so many in our generation that are, that are, they're playing out their relationship with God through this gift of prophecy. He's going to begin to establish some of those more and more into maybe not us saying we are prophets, but people noticing and saying, 
you, I recognize you as a prophet because your prophetic gift is so strong and you being used so um, specifically to bring God's heart into a situation or a person's life that you, you're operating in the authority of a prophet in your prophetic gifts. So I, I just personally feel like there are people with prophetic gifts right now that just need to continue to, to allow themselves the freedom to have these, these conversations with yeah, God that's good. and allow the things they're passionate about to play out in their prophetic. So if you're the kind of person that is more drawn towards big picture things, begin to ask God for insight and mainly for his heart right. regarding these issues and then begin to speak what you hear. I, I love, you mentioned the Elijah list earlier in terms of a lot of what's on the Elijah list and other prophetic sources. Um, they're mostly just words of encouragement. I think that's, that's really important because yeah. when we, when we begin to pick up on the heart of God and his hopeful perspective, yes. then he can trust us with those bigger picture, um, black and white things of this is going to happen by this date, because it's at that point, it's not an issue of, am I a prophet or not? Am I right? Or am I wrong? We're simply doing what we've been doing all along, which is God, you want to be known and your love needs to be displayed in this situation. And in order for it to happen, I need some black and white stuff right now. Yeah. And he'll meet you in that place and you'll begin to trust what you're hearing because he trusts you with his heart and his perspective in general over issues and, and things. And then, you know, like you said, for me, that really comes out with individuals because I, I, I relate more to that part of God's heart. Um, I love God's heart in the bigger picture issues, and I feel right. passionate about that, but not in the same way that you do. I feel drawn to people that are hurting yeah. and that are wrestling within themselves over more of their heart issues and their individual stories. And so that's usually where my prophetic gifting kicks in more. And it can be pretty specific, you know, yeah. either it's right or wrong. Either you know a person with that name or you don't. And yeah. Um, or something God just showed me about you is either true or not. Yeah. I've been reading, and I haven't finished reading it yet, um, Sean Boltz's new book. We highly recommend his material on the prophetic. Uh, he's personally gone to a whole nother level with it. But in, in reading that, it's just reawakened in me um, a desire to want to carry God's heart and be um, to partner with him, to be on assignment with him in ways that he and I can speak into people's hearts, lives, and into situations. I'd like to grow into the bigger picture of, um, you know, we've been with people in high places of leadership that I've had some prophetic insight for. Yep. Um, but again, it's been more on heart issues. Anyway, we're all growing in this. I love it that you've made yourself vulnerable and kind of shared where a little bit of your journey in that has been. And, um, I just feel like I can speak on behalf of a lot of people that have been impacted by your prophetic voice that we're grateful for it. I hear, I read the emails that come in all the time. People are so grateful for, um, how you, you aren't afraid to speak what you are perceiving. And you also aren't afraid to say if you're wrong and if you haven't heard correctly. And, um, I just hope that you step out more and more in the gift that you have, because I believe that the body of Christ is hungry for more clarity. And in that, God might use you to help them learn how to forgive when you're wrong, you know? And, yeah. and as the prophetic voices, we get the opportunity to give people uh, chances to respond to the prophetic words and respond when we're wrong. And it, it's all a test for all of our hearts, you know, yeah. in the end. So. That's so good. I think perhaps we'll do another. I was just thinking it would be worth doing a whole nother podcast sometime on on just, uh, you know, there are prophetic voices of, of doom and gloom that are always there as well. And, um, you know, and I, I just I think there's it's worth tackling as a topic mm -hmm. uh, sometime. You know, we, we used to teach the church if that you should be able to pick up the hope that's in a prophetic word by the second sentence and if, uh, or, you know, second, third, whatever. And if you don't, you're probably not his list. You're not probably, it's probably not a word from God you're, you're hearing. 
It can be something that's in agreement with the second heaven. And, and, um, and unfortunately, we have, um, again, people that that's all they do is talk about judgment and they'll speak of earthquakes and storms and, and they do it enough times, enough places that just the law of averages is going to catch up with you at some point because we have storms and earthquakes. Meaning they're going to be right some, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, but it's so vague, yeah. the word, they, but they feel that that was a yeah. confirmation to them. Yeah. And it's such an Old Testament model as well. Um, and I'm already going into a little bit, but I, I think it's worth having a whole... Uh, discussion on that and 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 I really think the Lord wants us um, uh, growing from that yeah you know? and I know how it's empowered um, I feel like the Lord showed me some reasons you know some of the understanding how that thinking gets empowered and how some yeah. wrong understanding both of his heart and of the prophetic in general yeah and so that could be good and for the future. Old Testament he really did have to give them words of warning or judgment whatever you want to call them um, it's to me it's it's a reflection of the age of society at the time just like my two-year-old I'm going to correct them in public but I'm not going to correct my my 15 year old in public there's a there's a relationship that grows and so if God is addressing specific things that need correcting or adjusting in, in the thinking of his people in the Old Testament, by the New Testament, and certainly by now, he's very jealous over our individual ability to hear directly from him. And that doesn't mean we no longer need prophetic voices. It just means the prophetic voices have a different focus and a different agenda. And, and God still is very much correcting us and warning us, but he sent the Holy Spirit when Jesus returned to heaven so that we could each hear and recognize his voice of correction and love and adjustments that we have to make. Yeah. So it, there's it's, so much more. Right. I know we started going into what we're saying in our next session, that 1 Corinthians 14, he who prophesies let him do it to exhort, edify, and comfort. So it kind of gives us parameters mm -hmm. that are not the same parameters as the Old Testament. Like you said, the Old Testament, there wasn't, you could check with the Holy Spirit inside of you. And so there was a need for there to be a different level. And they were at a younger age, uh, as it were. Society the, wise, Society, yeah. the body of Christ, whatever. And so there was a, a need to be led in a, in a different way. But, all right, well, do you want to pray for people? Sure. All right. Father, thank you so much for um, the gifts of your spirit that you've made available to us, especially this one of prophecy. And um, we thank you for the prophetic voices that are growing among us. And we bless them. The ones that have been um, stepping out and have been wrong and have grown and become right. And those that are um, risking and, and really insisting on growing the body of Christ up into these gifts. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you that you want to speak to us. We want to hear, and we want to be able to recognize your voice um, and your, your, your perspectives from all the different places that you're constantly speaking, and give us ears to hear and recognize you. Um, give us hearts that perceive your heart so that the words we speak um, on your behalf that we attribute to you, those words would reflect your heart, and we reflect the things that you're focusing on in our generation. Yes, and we bless every person who's listening, their prophetic gift. You said um, that we would all prophesy. Yeah. And so we bless every one of yes, you Lord. to um, grow in your ability to hear and recognize God's voice yes. and to speak it in a way that would cause others to be filled with hope and with love and with joy and all the fruit of your spirit. Thank you, Father. Yes, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.